welcome to the very last week of Babies Are Not Pizzas with KC Women's Ministry Book Club. My name is Kristen Mason, and I am the Programs Director with KC Women's Ministry. And I'm really excited to have Cindy here with us today. And she is our Community Relations Director. Uh, Her screen name says Dustin, but I assure you her name is Cindy. (laughs) It's doing that. I'm not sure why. Okay, well, let's jump right into it, and I will just pull the questions up. Okay, so I'm actually really excited that you came to book club today because the very, like, this entire, these two chapters just really made me think of you a lot, and just, like, what you and I currently um, are going through with uh, life and birth work and ministry Uh work, and it's just very applicable. The very first topic that's actually covered at the beginning of chapter 10 is the stress involved with leaving a steady paycheck in order to start working on birth work. (laughs) There is nothing like that at all, is there? No, it's its own special experience. Um you know, leaving not necessarily just for birth work, but for uh, any kind of passion, heart work that's going to take you away from that steady paycheck, but, you know, with the potential to really pay off. And I know that that's something that gets posted on doula groups a ton is where people say, how do you make this your full-time gig? Um, How do you get there? And Um, sometimes, (laughs) you know, you just have to do it and sometimes you plan it out really well and um I think a lot of more often than not it's a process of a little bit of both you plan it out really really well and then everything that you thought you had planned out you just have to go for it Mm -hmm. at some point the moment is you just jump and then supplement with DoorDash and supplement with DoorDash (laughs) there's always something you can supplement with there will always be a way Yeah. My, my plan was to basically do more than one, uh, birth work, heart work at a time. Um, Mm -hmm. so teaching childbirth education while doing postpartum work, while doing birth work so that I wasn't dependent on one thing at a time. And I have to tell you at first that was incredibly overwhelming and didn't pay off because I was scheduling all these childbirth education classes that people weren't coming to because you need the word of mouth before people will sign up for it. Or they just take that dinky hospital class, which they actually talk about in here, how terrible childbirth education tends to be through hospitals. Some of them are good. Not bashing all of them. I'm saying some of them are terrible. Uh, the quote that she uses actually is, all you learn is where to park in the parking lot. <laughs> which sounds about you know, right. I personally remember that from my childbirth education class. I remember that the only thing I could actually remember was at least I know where to park mm-hmm. when I get to the hospital. Yeah, the feedback that I get a lot is um, basically teaching you how to be a good patient, um, show you where to go, and that's pretty much the extent of it, Um, and that's Mm -hmm. very common. You end up with a tour of the hospital that takes, I mean, it's a two-hour class, and a tour of the hospital is an hour. That's enough time for an intro, a very quick overline of hospital policy, maybe a game, and then time to go walk. Um, But yeah, so, you know, Rebecca Decker talks about the, the fear of leaving her job and um, going through, you know, health insurance and just the reality of going from working for somebody else to being an entrepreneur. And it's scary. And there's all kinds of stuff that you should do to prepare for it and to kind of, you know, definitely take uh, some classes first. There's all yes. kinds of all kinds of different Sorry, classes that you can do. <laughs> yep. Udemy, uh, Eventbrite, YouTube, find some respectable people that have content posted or take an actual entrepreneurship class from, well, I say actual, but take a mm-hmm. traditional entrepreneurship okay. class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, as well. There's um, all kinds of different, um, we're actually there's building. There's a lot of resources too out there at like your local community center. Look up, reach out to your um my, I'm sorry, my name, my, your city, small business, um, community, my 
brain is blanking. I don't know I'm what so you're sorry. alluding to. I know libraries are a great place to go, but I don't think that's what you were talking about. It's not, but let me um, Google, Google this. I'm going to Google it. Your city's chamber of commerce. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. has a lot of small business resources, um, a lot of networking opportunities, and a lot of ways of um, helping you get out there. They also do a lot of classes in a lot of the smaller um, cities because they want you to succeed. Your small business succeeding is going to be good for them. So make sure that you reach out to them, let them know that you're around, let them know that you're doing something, and um, see what they have to uh, help you out. Yeah. No. My my son has decided that he's extra hungry and wants to stay up late to eat extra dinner. And you know, <laughs> just in case he needs it, I didn't tell him no. So I I am muting myself whenever the chewing gets loud or if he starts uh, making comments about his dinner. <laughs> Okay, so page 189, and I know that you don't have your book and that's totally okay. I, I will don't, so you're gonna have to guide me a little here. That's fine. Some people who follow this online don't buy the books either. They just, I read, so it's okay. What's funny is I actually had the book before anybody else. It, I got it almost as soon as it came out. Um, and I've read the book a couple of times and I love the book. It's one of the things that fired me up in birth work. Um, right at the beginning, I love it. It's just now somewhere. I know it is in my house. I know that I've lent it out a couple of times, but it is currently in my house. I just am not sure where. It's somewhere in the ethos. That is okay. It's all right. All so of the other you, amazing books. I'm going to read you a uh, an excerpt from Babies Are Not Pizza starting on page 189, and then we're going to talk about it. So in this dental clinic, my children were categorized as simply children, lesser beings who do not have names or autonomy and must follow the rules for the sake of tradition and safety. They don't follow the norms. If they don't follow the norms, then it is appropriate to use physical, uh, to physically enforce the adult's preferences on the child. If they fight back, then the staff must retaliate to show the child who is boss. Ugh. The parents mm -hmm. are only slightly higher in status than the child. They don't have the right to question the dentist's actions. The dentist assumes that he has the ultimate authority to force on a child without asking for parental consent. The child is a task that must be performed. The teeth must be cleaned in the exact, with the exact instruments and method that the staff choose. In the end, the child is nothing more than a lesser being's mouth and mouths don't have feelings or psyche or trauma. You can do whatever you want with the child's mouth and all while students are watching. And then she compares this to labor and delivery units. And I thought that that was amazing. Um, this is basically the event that caused Rebecca Decker to finally go, I am done. I am all in. I don't want to be a part of any of this system anymore at all. It was her experiencing seeing her children's autonomy being taken away right in front of her. But um, she finally took the leap, quit her job, and started full-time investing into evidence-based birth. Mm -hmm. Did that sound a lot it's, like some births to you? You know, I've experienced exactly the same situation with my children in dental clinics, um, if not worse. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've seen the same exact situation in births. And it's amazing how easily they correlate. And then you mm -hmm. start wondering, well, where else are we doing this in our healthcare system? Yeah. Uh, and so Where it becomes else does very. The body just turn into a body part. Yeah. How quickly are we just turning the body part into a body and not a person? Mm -hmm. And um, very quickly, it's becoming. Well, let's just say I read this book, and all of a sudden, every time I would turn a page, I was ranting and <laughs> um, on a soapbox to just about anybody who would listen, whether you were my family or the grocery store clerk. Or an innocent person at the drive-thru. <laughs> it ignited your passion. It, it really did. Yeah. That's this awesome. book is what led to me quitting my full-time job. It was the catalyst. I don't know that Dustin is thrilled that he bought it for me for Christmas. <laughs> Good job, Dustin. <laughs> That's really funny. 
Yeah, and I really like that she talks about all the while students are watching, because I think that it's important for us to kind of know where doctors and nurses and midwives are coming from when they're doing what they learned. Um, I was doing a, an episode of diversity and inclusion, which is a new series that the ministry is launching on our podcast. Mm -hmm. And, um, our first one is called humanizing, uh, client clients in the birth space. And she talked about how all nurses and all doctors and very basic training are taught to always ask before they touch you or they touch a client, um, or in their case patient. And I found that so interesting because she herself is a nurse, uh, uh, Charity Bean, who I was interviewing, and she talked about how that's that's basics, that's absolute basics, and she was really surprised to hear me say that's not common practice. That in my experience, that has been in the experiences that I've heard from other people, it hasn't been. Um, that t it tends to be, I'm going to check your cervix now, or I need you to move onto your back. There's no asking beforehand, and the one that's craziest to me. Um, well, almost they're all crazy, but I'm going to up your Pitocin now. No question. Can you handle it? Where's your level at? Um, explain to you what I'm doing. Just walk in the room. I'm going to up your Pitocin now. <laughs> Why? No, where you're going to talk to me actually is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I just find that that's so crazy that then what happens is students watch and then they see in actual practice, we don't ask for patients and clients permission and mm -hmm. they learn the culture of the space that they're in. Now, Mom. okay good night well, we do the same thing with our children you know we there's a constant say do as I say not as I do but our children are always going to do as we do not as we say and if I tell my kids don't touch that it's hot but then I am constantly reaching in and touching the fire uh, they're going to learn that they can reach in and touch the fire because it's not really going to burn them at least that part of it's not so if we're teaching our doctors and our nurses, you need to always ask for consent, but then we're showing them that they don't have to ask for consent and that they're ne nothing's ever going to happen, then why are they going to ask for consent? Why are they going to, they're going to learn the language of, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the Pitocin now. I'm going to check your cervix now. We're going to go ahead and start prepping for a C-section now. And it seems to me that it's more efficient. Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't have to ask for permission. They don't have to have that conversation. Then they can get things done faster. And we mm -hmm. all know that there's a lot of pressure on them to get things done, get it done quickly and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. So I understand it. I know where a lot of it's coming from. It's also still not okay. Exactly. Um, and I find it really almost empowering to know what the problem is, where the issue is coming from. And the more that I study, especially Rebecca Decker, I'm mean, studying her stuff and taking her classes and everything, um, having a lot of family that are nurses, doing interviews like uh, the one that I did with Charity Bean, which is amazing and I learned a lot from. Um, the more that I learn what the issue is, which then is step one in any program to how to solve it, you know, you have to know exactly what the problem is before you can tackle it. Mm -hmm. So, and I really like the um, akinness to a dentist that is not a child yes. dentist and doesn't know how to work with them. Um, I think that that is a perfect analogy and I really like how she did it. Um, I did too. I would say, what were your overall feelings about chapter 10? Um, but I don't think that you would remember. I can tell you my overall feelings about the book, but Let's we've seen the results in a that. minute. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> We have chapter 11 and then we're done. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so chapter 10, um, my first 11, sorry. The first question that I have written down is how does trauma build you to do bigger and better in your work? So the trauma that you experienced in your births or that you experienced in um, a secondary trauma in other people's births, um, mm -hmm. how does that fuel you to do more? as a birth worker or as, you know, the director of a nonprofit that serves birth workers. Yeah. Because we're both. <laughs> um, you know, it's coming with the intense questions, did you? Those, that is a big one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we have all experienced our own trauma 
I think that's what initially starts leading us towards some of this work. I don't know that I've met many people who moved into birth work without some sort of trauma surrounding either their own birth or their own experience of birth in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a few, it it does happen, but it's, it's rare. Um, Most of the people that I talk to who are in this line of work have experienced some kind of trauma and said, this has to change. And I'm not going to let this happen to somebody else. And so for me, that's where it started was, I don't want this to happen again. I, I saw how birth was supposed to work my hand's looking really weird with this background. Sorry. (laughs) Um, I saw how birth was supposed to work, which I saw that because my mother experienced trauma during her first birth with me. So then I saw what birth should have been when she then experienced that with my brothers and sisters in a a home birth that was, that went the way that she wanted it to, um, progressed the way that she expected it to. Obviously it was birth. It wasn't planned, you know, home birth, but it's still, um, you know, it's birth. It's unexpected. It's the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I saw how it was supposed to be. And then my own births weren't that way. Mm-hmm. There were still beautiful parts of it, but there was trauma involved. There were things that were done without my consent. There were things, even when I thought I did everything right, even when I thought I was advocating for myself, even when I thought I had educated myself, Uh, there were still things done without my consent by someone that I trusted in my birth space. And I still trusted them. I still think that they're a phenomenal uh, midwife. I would still recommend them for care, but because of the situation that they were in, because of the education that they had, because of the time that we were in, um, the way it was 20 years ago at birth, that's where we were. And now we know better, we do better and we continue on. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I'm in birth work. Um, Now, as I am meeting our clients and working in the capacity that I am with the ministry, meeting people, um, finding out these other stories, finding out where we're at and what's going on in the birth world now, excuse me, um, the passion just gets stronger and stronger. Things have to change. Things have gotten a little bit better in the last 20 years, but things have also gotten worse in the last 20 years. Um, I think a hundred years ago before medical intervention got, got involved, we had it right. <laughs> and, you know, then we started going in the opposite direction thinking we were going to get it better. And now we have to get it back to where we can find the happy medium of the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being able to use medicine, the balance, uh, the interventions when, what, you know, they're needed when they're life-saving and Mm -hmm. not when they're convenient, um, Mm -hmm. or let's be honest, when they're convenient for the doctor. Yeah. Right. Right. That's yes. What I meant. I suppose if, (laughs) um, we're all, we're always advocating for the decisions of our clients, even if they're making decisions out of convenience, it's whatever they want <laughs> yep. for sure. I just want it to be an educated decision of their choice, not someone else's. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. Okay. It's another reading, um, page 197 through 198. So I'm just going to flip. Okay. So, um, do you remember the legal case that kind of launched um, Birth Monopoly? Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, if you've been keeping up with the book club, um, we've been, she sprinkles this throughout the book where she's talking about uh, founder Kristen, not me, different Kristen, <laughs> um, uh, who founded Birth Monopoly, supporting her client Caroline, who had been very seriously injured in her birth. Um, to the point of not being able to have sex anymore, um, in pain constantly, it hurts to sit, sit down. The baby's head was held inside of her while the nurses literally wrestled her down onto the table. And so she's in a lot of pain for the rest of her life. And she took the hospital to court. And this is the transcript of when the defense attorney 
was trying to uh, corner her. Um, and so that's that's where we are. Um, the hospital's defense lawyer began his final line of questioning. Kristen said she was incredulous as it dawned on her, but she couldn't think of any other possibility for his bizarre questions. It seemed like he might actually believe Caroline cared more about her birth experience than the life of her baby and that she would admit that on the stand. And just right there, how often is that what people stigmatize having a birth plan as? Mm -hmm. Like I've heard it many, many times. The number of times that I have had clients tell me that they would like to make a birth plan, but they wanted to start with the most important thing is a happy, healthy baby. Mm -hmm. like, yes. I will write that down for you, but I'm very sad that you feel judged for having a birth plan to the point that you want it to be at the very top that you feel you have to mm -hmm. tell people that just because you have a birth plan doesn't mean that you want your baby to not be healthy. Right. Just that stigma on its own. Ugh, not a fan. Okay. Uh, defense attorney. And certainly if it were between using a wired monitor and no monitor at all, you were okay with using the wired monitor. monitor. Caroline. I mean, it certainly is one of the biggest reasons why I moved from one hospital to the other, but I had come into a room that there was no wireless monitor. I did not want to go without monitoring my baby, and I could have moved around on the wired monitor, at least tried to move off my back. Defense attorney, and certainly if the monitor had shown something that required some emergency change of plan, such as an emergency that required a C-section, you were okay with that, changing your plans to respond to whatever the monitor showed. Caroline, I would have done I mean, based on the monitor and the doctor saying it's not looking right. I think we're sort of past that point, though, when the baby came. Defense attorney. At that point, though, well, you wanted a safe delivery, didn't you? Caroline. Absolutely. That was my first priority. The defense attorney shuffled his papers and said, Your Honor, may I have a moment? Thank you. That's all I have. So that stigma, mm -hmm. that's fun. Um, how often would you say that you run into that stigma and um, how do you handle it? <laughs> Personally? Mm -hmm. you have to buy I haven't done a lot of clients, you know that. It's not something I do a lot. Um, I don't think I have ever talked about a birth plan without having someone say, we just want a happy, healthy baby. Um, when I was having children, when mine were younger and we would talk about birth plans, um, the first thing that was usually said with most of my friends and most of the people that I was helping with them was my doctor doesn't really want me to do a birth plan. They think that they're a joke. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would have a lot of nurses tell me uh, when they come up with a birth plan, we just start prepping for the C-section. So um, that's my experience with that. Fun. <laughs> I, that whole case, everything that happened with that, yeah. <laughs> it was horrifying that it happened, but it also mm -hmm. exposed a lot to the general public. Mm -hmm. um, she describes how the when Caroline was on the stand telling her story, a lot of the jurors were openly crying and holding hands because it was just that horrifying of an experience. Mm -hmm. But the nurses themselves didn't remember the birth because it was that normal for them. Right. So it was a blessing that it brought attention to the problem. Always prefer for the problem not to be there in the first right. place. But the fact that it exposed, I mean, that level, that's bad. That's really bad. And this was supposed to be the only natural hospital in town, which is something that as a doula I run into where they're advertising that they're a, a birth center right 
And it's, they just renamed their maternity word ward birth center because they know it's a, their marketing team was like, all right, sure. Sure, why not? Well, we're a birth center now. That's what people are looking for. Now you have to know you need a freestanding birth center in order for it to be an actual birth center. How many people are going to know that? It's worked quite well for them. Um, some hospitals claim to be all more natural and they actually are, but it's been my experience. My experience with birth plans, um, is a lot of, um, lying to be perfectly honest. This is, I think the, the growth response that now it is uncouth. Everybody knows that people giving birth are supposed to be able to have a birth plan because it looks like this. I think that's the difference that it right. makes. But now what they're doing in my experience is uh, a lot of doctors are now yes manning the birth plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. We do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is, this is what I get a lot. Oh, this is all routine for us. So I'm going, no, it's not. <laughs> I've been here for so yeah. many births and I can tell you right now that this is not routine for you. It's not. And so then the doctors and the prenatals are reading these birth plans and they're going, yeah, sure. That's fine. This is routine. And then I say, okay, get them to sign the birth plan. <laughs> Give their, okay, have them sign it, put it in your file and then we'll move on. Then we get there and the nurses go, we don't do any of this. I know. <laughs> I am well aware of that. You should tell your doctor. The doctor right. is well aware of it too. Uh, mm-hmm. But by that point, they think they've got you. Um, because what are you going to do? Walk out of the hospital while you're in labor? Okay. You can. You always can. You always can. But, mm-hmm. but probably not going to. Chances are prob- probably not. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, which is one of the reasons that having a, a doula and an advocate in your space is so monumental really because gonna... then they can push toward that. Say, so, you know stick to the birth plan as much as possible and have an honest conversation with your doula Mm -hmm. about your hospital yeah their experiences look at the hospital policies because hospital policy is what's going to actually set the standard your doctor's preference doesn't fly in the actual Mm -hmm. birth space it's nice to have a a doctor that leans towards your preferences Um, especially once we get to the pushing part, which is really going to mostly be the only time that you see them. Um, if you're wanting to push in multiple positions, then having a doctor that supports you in that is going to be really important. But other than that, Mm -hmm. they're just not around that much. Labor and deliveries are run by labor and delivery nurses. Um, really. So they are, and they're going to stick the policy. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. And they honestly, are. Um, one of the biggest places that I've found the most information on labor and delivery and policies and what's actually happening mm-hmm. um, as a mom, as a doula, um, is in the mom groups. So if you're if you're trying to find out what's really happening, you're researching hospitals, and you do have the right to research hospitals. So if you're Please watching do. this and you're kind of wondering, you have the right to research hospitals. And if you're four months along, six months along, eight months along. And you suddenly decide you're not quite happy with what you might be finding out about the hospital you're delivering at. You can start deciding you're going to change. Um, yeah. So it's your right to research the hospital. It's your right to decide if that's where you really want to deliver. It's your right to decide if this is a doctor that you want to have deliver your baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, babies are born, not delivered. Because <laughs> they're not pizzas. I want this. I'm not even sure I can finish with on my plate, but thank you so much for asking. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Continue, Cindy. No, that's what I might have yeah. process got distracted mm-hmm. by asking us if I wanted more food. Oh, no. Um, yeah. And we actually, the ministry is working on collecting information because it's really hard to get a hold of um, for different hospitals. We're working on it. It's not available yes. yet, but who knows? Maybe in the near future it will be. Hopefully we can get a lot of that kind of information for you so that you have a one-stop place where you can look and see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do they really allow this? Is this really going to happen? Having doulas that have worked in that space before is really helpful or that have mentors that have worked in that space before. Um, you know, just because you have a doula or doula, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't hire her. 
or just because she hasn't worked in that particular hospital, but maybe um, talk to her, say, do you know other doulas? Because we sh- are a network. And if your doula doesn't have doula friends, then that that's actually more of a flag than if she is uh, considered an experienced doula or not. So she's worked herself yes. out of the birth world. That's kind of a sad thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it does happen. So yeah, it's asking that and then amazing. asking them to talk to you candidly about it is also really great. If you're a doula, you should be talking to your clients candidly about, um, you know, specific hospitals. There's one specific hospital in this area. I don't work in anymore. I'm done. I'm not going back. I won't do it. Um, nope. Nope. I have qualms about sending other doulas in there as a director, but I'm also not going to just like blacklist an entire hospital for a ministry. Um, but whenever I see someone sign up there, I'm, oh, 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 not there. Oh, not there. Anyway. Okay. Um, so Caroline won the lawsuit. She won quite a lot from her lawsuit. She won millions of dollars. Um, what does that say to you? as a mother, as a person who's given birth before, as a birth worker? <laughs> I just looked for your child. You what? <laughs> you looked off screen and I looked too. <laughs> That's funny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what does that say to you? That she won. I mean, people are listening. People's eyes are opening. There are definitely people are taking notice that things can't stay the way that they are, which is good. We have a long way to go. I am. It's always exciting to see when things like this change. Um, Because we know that we have, these fights are so hard to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the fact that they are so hard to win when they are so black and white is discouraging. And so it takes so many of us to keep fighting this in so many different channels, in so many different places, in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's a constant. Mm -hmm. To me, money talks. Oh. And the, you know, the reason that the nurses were reacting in that way, according to their testimony, is because they were worried about her giving birth in a way that they were not used to because she didn't want to give birth on her back. She wanted to do on her hands and knees. So they were mid flipping her um, and they didn't want her to give birth without the doctor being in the room, which is why they held the baby in um, because they were afraid of getting in trouble. And they said they didn't remember doing it, but that, that would have been the reasoning why if it did happen. Um, So it's possible that they were lying that they don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't know is a hard thing to argue with or I don't remember. Um, but if they, if that is true that they actually don't remember it, you know, and then they came back and said, okay, well, these are probably the reasons why, um, what if they were afraid of causing you damage by holding you down? What if they were afraid of, if I violate this client's autonomy, then something bad is going to happen. And so we flip that into, you have to respect the person giving birth or you're going to And that's the goal. Mm-hmm. The goal mm-hmm. is to remind people that these are, that the patient is a human being and not just a body. Yep. Um, yeah. I think that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and I don't think that a nurse as a human being ever forgets that. It's when she is there in the role, sorry, she or he is, or they are there in the role in that moment and they've got the hospital policies in mind Mm -hmm. and they have all of these rules and regulations that they as a nurse have to follow. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not the nurse that has to be reminded, it's the hospital policies that have to be changed. That Mm -hmm. this is not a number, it's a human being and 
in order to change the hospital policies, we have to fix the insurance. And it's just such a huge systemic system that has to be changed that we've allowed to become a system, a system of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you follow the money and you follow the trail, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. It gives us an avenue though. It gives it us, does. it gives us a, a clear picture of the full scope of what the issue is. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people just say the problems are those nurses. No, the problem that is the so short-sighted and not where we're going. Um, I mean, honestly, so often I think those poor nurses, even when I'm in there, um, you know, the specific birth incidents that I was at where it was a singular nurse that has made it, I will not go there again. And there's been other things as well. I mean, that was just the catalyst. Um, even her, I was looking at her and going, what made you like this? Yeah. You did not get into birth work this way. There's no yeah. way. There's no way. What made you like this? Um, and it was sad, but it, it gives us a clear avenue for change. And for me, it, it, it's overwhelming if you think about it in full scope. But when I think about it in steps, now that we have them, I get really excited. Yes. You know, birth has changed a lot since Rebecca Decker gave birth. How much is it going to change before my daughter gives birth, which is my goal. Isn't that exciting so, to think about? Yeah. I mean, if I have my say, my daughter will give birth at home. <laughs> Surrounded by doulas. <laughs> no, that's my preference, but she can give birth wherever she wants. <laughs> If she drags me kicking and screaming into a hospital to, to support her, I totally will. I always have support, a waiting room full of doulas. <laughs> I always support wherever people want to give birth. I will go there. Um, just, you know, I, if she like picks this one hospital, I'm going to be like, are you just being spiteful at this point? <laughs> She'll know, but I will go, I will go. Um, but I'm just, you know, maybe even that hospital will be like an amazing place to give birth and it'll be respectful. And there, we have avenues now to do that. Um, joining together, Case and Women's Ministry has a, a grassroots program. You can get involved with that. Writing yes. uh, to your local representatives to let them know what's going on and to kind of help with that. Blasting out, you know, the rates telling your stories at the different hospitals that you've been to, you know, tell your story. It's an important story. And um, being candid and open with what happened to you and when and where, good stories, bad stories. You know, we need to start talking about these things. People need to know what they're getting themselves into, where they go, and then they're gonna shop differently. And then that money's gonna talk. Lawsuits for people who've been violated, I mean, not a huge Sue happy person, but many talks things. Yeah. And that's, that's how we're, how we're going to get it done. And I mean, with people out there, like birth monopoly, evidence-based birth, there's a bunch of others that are all really fantastic and working towards it. Uh, Casey Women's Ministry. Yes. Uh, uh, program. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I really like how you said, uh, start shopping. I don't think people realize Healthcare is a retail industry, just like clothing and anything else. Um, you can shop for your healthcare. If you don't like your doctor, you can go find a different doctor. And if you don't like your hospital, you can go find a different hospital. They are everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you don't, don't like, like your it, midwife, you can find a different midwife. Find a different mid midwife. If you mm -hmm. don't like your doula, you can find a different doula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of us. We're everywhere, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> especially in the Casey um, Metro area. You 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 sneeze and you find a doula. We're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> We're all pretty fantastic. Um, but a special plug for Casey Women's Ministry: we have some really amazing doulas here <laughs> with hearts of gold. Um, but healthcare is got the, you have to see your family doctor who's the only doctor in your hometown and there's only one hospital. Healthcare has changed. It is a retail industry. It is a service industry and they are here to serve you. And if you don't like what you're getting, 
go find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of times, sometimes just talking to other people, you got to find those other options. Sometimes it's not as black and white and super easy, um, Mm -hmm. but they're generally out there and reaching out, finding, you know, other local birth workers to, or non-local birth workers that can find your local birth workers. And we're a network. We all talk, um, can help you, especially if you're feeling stuck in your current situation. Um, there might be different things that we can do to help. Maybe if you have to go to that hospital, because like Cindy said, there's the only one hospital in your town, which does happen. Um, unfortunately we can send advocates in there with you. You know, you don't have to go in there by yourself and withdrawing consent and saying, you can't touch me. They can't touch you. So we can send an advocate who can hang out in the waiting room and hang on the phone with you. If that's the only way we can get to you, we can and have done it because you're COVID positive and Cindy doesn't mind getting up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cindy leads our grassroots program. And, uh, sometimes we send her places in the middle of the night, say, Hey, there's this person. She needs you. She's COVID positive. So you can't go in her room, but you can hang out there. Right. And then she does. <laughs> Everyone deserves support. Mm-hmm. And should have it. Okay. One final quote on page 200, and then we'll be finished with Babies Are Not Pizzas. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Hospital staff, nurses, midwives, and physicians, they're hurting, and so many of them are traumatized. As the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. My theory is if we communicate love to people who are hurting, that might be the most powerful intervention of all. Because if we want hospital staff to make big changes to their behavior and culture, they have to feel secure first. They have to feel loved. And yeah, that about wraps it up. I, I really like that sentiment. I think that it's really important. I know sometimes it's easy to lose track of everyone just the, you know, even just in this book, the, the bad, bad stories, the sad stories, um, that get told the overwhelming problem, but the biggest way that we can fight is actually doing it. Um, and remaining full of love and respect the whole time mm-hmm. for ourselves, yes. for our clients, for the people we're working with. Yeah. Even for the people that are really frustrating for us sometimes. Yeah. It's great sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Being a mother helps me sometimes where I'm like, okay, I can get through my child's screaming tantrum at 2 a.m. with love. I can get through this. Yeah, we just right. practice those breathing techniques that we practice with our clients sometimes. I, you can hear me doing them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Open throat. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah. So that's Babies Are Not Pizzas. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We are going on holiday break. So we are going to be taking um, the rest of the year off and we will be back in January with Ghost Bellies. So see you the first Monday of January with that. Bye, Cindy. Thank you for joining me today.